Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Coding 101 is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Coding 101 is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com, and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code C101 in the billing section for a $10 credit. And by Lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit Lynda.com slash C101. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash C101. On this episode of Coding 101, we say goodbye to Carlos Souza in the last bit of Ruby on Rails. Hello, and welcome to Coding 101. It's Twitch show for the Code Monkey and the Code Warrior. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, and joining me as always is my super special non-guest permanent type co-host. I actually <laughs> kind of like that. That, that. That's a good title. Mr. Lou Maresca from Microsoft. He is a senior lead developer. Lou, thanks for coming back to Coding 101. Hey, thanks for having me again, Padre. Now, we will jump into the last bit of uh, a Ruby, Ruby on Rails with Carlos Souza. It, it's actually been a really fun module. The last couple of weeks have been all about what Rails does to Ruby, and I think it, it really helped our audience to understand what a framework does, right? It's, 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 it helps the language actually fulfill its promise, and especially with Ruby on Rails, since it builds all those dependencies for you, to, to a lot of people in the group, it's, it's been like black magic. Yeah, I think that's really what frameworks are supposed to be about, though, right? Black magic, they're the black boxes of the world where you, you hopefully make things easier for yourself by uh, by utilizing some other you know a person's work so i think that's really where ruby comes in as, as a powerful language right right and, and actually there was a there's a there's an item that you put into the doc that i think is is very important because i have had some feedback from the episodes from people who were saying so all i have to do is let rails do everything for me right and uh, let, let's let's set it set things straight. Rails is great. A framework is great. Any framework for any language is fantastic for helping you do the scut work, getting that out of the way, so that you can have very consistent programs from one project to the next. However, before you go into that, there there is some basic design that you you do need to take care of. Uh, you you want to talk a little bit about that, Lou? Absolutely. So you know, there's a lot of you know there's a lot of principles out there today, and like like how you can become a better programmer and how you can make your code more maintainable and usable and you know where do you really start so i wanted to really kind of go over the basis you know where do you start and what can you use from a design principle standpoint to really write really good code and so there's there are several principles here one of them they call um, what we call the single responsibility principle and it's you know just a bunch of fancy words to say that the idea is that your the classes that you build in an object oriented language have only one responsibility and the, the thing is that it's really kind of hard to do because if you if you do that, that means you have to break up your code in a way that you know maybe your classes might be this huge thing and they do a bunch of things and now you have to figure out how to break it up. That's why it's always good to start from the beginning and build a class that's very small and lightweight and only does one thing. You, you know, Lou, that's actually one of those things that I think it carries on no matter how advanced of a programmer you are. You're always wanting to insert just that little bit more into that class because you don't want to have to break it out into a brand new class. But as you said, that's proper design. We all know that from the very first class that we've taken on object-oriented programming or class-based programming, they tell us, look, subdivide the responsibilities. Right. It's, it just gets, it's too easy to say, well, this is, this is such a simple function I need to add in. I'm, I'm just going to tag it onto this one that, that already exists. <laughs> That's right. It's 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 a whole principle of the KISS or keep 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 it simple, silly. That that whole principle means that keep your code simple. Keep keep those classes, those things doing one thing and one thing only, and then you move on to what they call the open and close principle. And that's exactly what you just talked about. I mean, the open and close principle is again just a fancy way in object-oriented language to say allow a person to extend the functionality, 
but close to modification. Don't modify that class to do something else, but, but allow people to actually extend its functionality and do more things. And so, and, and then usually that the whole principle is done by using inheritance in, um, in a, in an object oriented language. But again, it can be done other ways as well. And so the idea is maybe you can modify your code to just fix bugs and fix errors. But when you want it to do something else or, or you know, add functionality to it, it should always be extended in some way. Right. And, and this becomes really important whenever you're working in a group. And most of us, if, if you're going to go on in programming, you're going to have to work with others. And if you're constantly changing the class and adding functionality, it may make sense to you, but you may just have broken a dependency that someone had on your class. So as you said, yeah, fix bugs and then extend. Don't don't modify. That's right. Yeah. And this that one kind of leads into the third one, which is what they call code duplication. And what that means is a lot of people when they code, they tend to maybe grab code from other people's, you know, other people's libraries or, you know, when they're working with somebody or they might, you know, duplicate the code in several aspects. In that case, you find yourself writing the same code over and over again in different spots. And what that happens, that becomes what they call an unmanageable nightmare, what they call the root of many evils for duplication. And what you could do is when you have to fix a bug, you actually have to fix it in many different places and it just becomes really unmanageable. And so there was an old thing that I used to do with when I used to consult for, for programming. I used to have these cards, this deck of cards, and every card used to say abstract that. And when somebody <laughs> would come in front of me, they would give me a problem and I'd, and I'd blindly have them pick from the deck and they'd pull out a card and boom, it would say abstract that. And what they didn't know was every card said that. And the reason is abstraction leaves into that single responsibility principle, meaning that your functionality should be very simple and you should be able to pull that functionality out and create a class that only does that. And then that means you don't have to duplicate the code. You just have to use that class or that, that, that abstraction to be able to do the, the things that you need. And when you find yourself duplicating code, that means that you haven't abstracted your code or created that little block of code, that, that single responsibility class well enough. And you need to you know, look back and refactor your code so you can get that better. But l let me go to the other side here. How, how do you know when you've abstracted enough? Because, I mean, you can keep breaking down a logic tree into its individual components, and you, you might never stop. W when do you sure. say, okay, this is abstract enough? So there's a point. Like, if you're building a lot, like an API, then your abstraction can never be enough. Uh, the, <laughs> that means that the smaller components that you can do, people might need to be, want to be able to reuse those components. But when you're building an application, sometimes you know that, you know, this library for encryption is never going to be used anywhere else but the data pipeline. So I'm just going to leave it inside of here as part of the functions of it. I'm not going to break it out into its own class, you know, so other people can use it. I mean, it's really at your discretion. But again, writing separate abstractions, writing separate classes for responsibilities allows you to test things better as well. So like there's many different testing frameworks in all the different languages from Java, C Sharp, C++, and they allow you to uh, stub or mock out or fake an, a class or an object in a case and then allows you to test that object. And so by abstracting it, it's easier to test and easier to maintain. So when you say, is there a limitation? It can, you know, you don't want to have a class just have one function and do only one thing. And then you have like millions of classes. But in the same sense, by abstracting, you make it easier to maintain and easier to test. We've got Gardner in the chat room being a smart chat saying, I see <laughs> you are doing addition everywhere. Maybe you need to pull back to that step. But uh, yeah, that, I, I, I understand what you're talking about. Uh, as a programmer, you can never abstract enough, too much, right? I mean, right. You, it, it's keep going down until you find that foundational level and then go down a, a little bit more. But let's, let's move right. on from abstraction to error handling, because that's also something that I, I, it's, not, it's not as persistent as we go on, but especially when you're starting off, error handling is uh, baffling. That's right. So one of the things that you'll find is when you're coding, no matter what example, whether it's Ruby or Java, is you're going to get errors, right? And, and there'll be, what I'm talking about is not only compiling errors, but runtime errors, meaning, you know, the user goes and does something and let's say that your, your code doesn't handle it. Like maybe they, you know, they refresh a page or they, you know, click on something they shouldn't have and an error gets, you know, thrown by the framework or by, by the browser or by whatever app type um, of runtime you're using. And so the whole idea here is, you know, be able to handle errors as best as possible. So obviously you got to do a bunch of testing to bring those errors to the top so you can understand what they are. But in the same sense, when you don't know what those errors are or you know that there might be errors there that you don't know about, always look to collect them and, and create what they call a telemetry for it, meaning send those errors out to yourself somehow 
And so if you're building a piece of software, let's say a productivity piece of software, find a way to send those errors out to yourself. Like for instance, Windows has what they call a Watson service, which means when you're running an app and it has an error that it doesn't handle correctly, it actually sends that error over to Microsoft. Same thing with Google and its Chrome browser, you know, it sends a telemetry data out. Do the same thing with your software. If you know an error, handle it in a way that you know it's very graceful or send that error information out. Also be graceful to the user and let them know that there's a problem. But again, send that information out so you can learn by those errors and, and improve the software. Uh, Lou, I, I, we've been handling a lot of the design elements of good programming. In a second, I want to get into actual style and then testing that design to see if it actually meets up to our standards. But before Absolutely. we do that, do you mind if we uh, take a break just to talk about the first sponsor of this episode? Absolutely. Well, of, of course, the first sponsor has to be DigitalOcean. Now, what is DigitalOcean? DigitalOcean is a way to spin up your apps, your services, your programming as soon as possible. Now, in the old way, the old way was you would either build bare steel, you would go out and you would actually buy a server, you would install the OS of your choice, you would make sure that it had the services to run the, the programming that you actually wanted to run, and you'd have to open it up to the outside world, which, of course, meant you had to handle security. Now, when we moved past that, we started actually renting servers, or maybe renting parts of servers. That was, that's part of the internet economy. But we now want to evolve past even that. What if you had a way just to take your app, your service, your thing, encapsulate it in the OS of your choice and throw it up ready for production or testing? Well, that's exactly what DigitalOcean does. Now, whether you're an experienced code warrior or just getting started, you need flexible, reliable, and affordable hosting. DigitalOcean provides developers with droplets, which are virtual private servers that can be customized and deployed quickly to host websites, web apps, production applications, personal projects, virtual desktops, and almost everything else that you can think of with full root access. Think about that, folks. Think about how hard it is for you to get that, especially in today's virtualized world. Now, we've been using DigitalOcean here to stand up projects. Jeff Needles has been using it for mere stats. I've been using it for a little project I'm running on the side. And anytime we do something with Coding 101, if we want to open it up either to a sandbox environment where we can invite a few people in to break it, or when we actually want to open it up to production and the real world, well, we use DigitalOcean. It's built for developers, and it's used by over 400,000 of them, including me. Deploy and configure your droplets via a streamlined control panel or a simple API. Again, you can choose your OS. Do you want Ubuntu? Do you want CentOS? Do you want Debian, Fedora, Core, Core OS, or FreeBSD? You could do all of that, and a one-click install allows you to quickly deploy those common apps like Django, Docker, Drupal, LAMP, GitLab, MediaWiki, Node.js, WordPress, Ghost, Magneto, OwnCloud, Ruby on Rails, and more. All servers are built on hex core machines with dedicated ECC RAM and RAID SSD storage. And the servers can have up to 20 CPUs, 64 gigabytes of memory, and 640 gigabytes of SSD hard space. Now, it's scalable, which means it's going to meet your demands. You can scale it from something that's small and in a sandbox to something that's going to be in production for the entire interwebs. You get full-featured DNS management in an easy-to-manage domain panel, and you can use dedicated IPs. They also give you web console access with HTML5 plus SSH, SFTP, and KVM VNC for virtual desktops. They've got an extremely active community, and, and this is one of the things that you really want to look for. You don't just want a service that can meet your needs. You want a service that can meet the needs you don't even know you have yet, and that's what the community does for you. It's so easy to get started, and you can deploy your SSD cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. I don't know why you wouldn't want to try it now. Now, DigitalOcean has incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing, servers starting at only $5 per month. There's also hourly pricing available, starting at less than a penny per hour. But we're going to make it so that you can get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. That's right, folks. Risk-free. Jump in. See if it's right for you. Visit DigitalOcean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, go to the billing section and enter the promo code c 101 for a free $10 credit. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do for you. That's DigitalOcean.com. And once you sign up, enter the code C101 in the billing section for a $10 credit. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support of Coding 101. Now, Lou, we've got our design features down. What about style? Because style is important. We've been talking about style in this, in this module, Ruby and Ruby on Rails because you do want to keep to a certain style, you do want to stay within the conventions, what's the best practices for this? 
So there's, there's a lot of best practice for this, but there's some high level things that you should pay attention to. For one thing, when you're writing functions or methods, you should name them correctly, meaning naming things are very hard to do. But like, for instance, you know, when you have a class that does something, you got to make sure that those functions, especially the public ones, the ones that pe other people can use, are named correctly. And so what you want to do is make sure that you're naming your functions or your methods um, based off of intent or their responsibility. And sometimes more verbosity is the better. So like sometimes, you know, maybe you'll have a really long function name or method name, but it will help, you know, not only that, but of course also add comments to that function. A lot of languages today have the ability to add comments, but always naming a function name because some people just use IntelliSense today in some of the, right. in some of the IDEs. And so you naming that function, something that's very, uh, you know, you can understand its responsibility or what it needs to do, then the better. So that's really the number one thing is making sure you do that. And that same thing goes for variable names too. So if you have some public variable names or in, even internal variable names, make sure you're naming them correctly uh, in, and in their intent, what are they storing? What are they doing? Uh, are they global? Are they not global? Um, and sometimes, you know, make sure the name might be, be pretty verbose, pretty long. So make sure that, uh, again, you're, you're naming things correctly when you're storing things. Yeah, I, then, I actually, I had a project when I was still in college that uh, I did not do this. Uh, I had... <laughs> Uh, I had, it actually worked quite well, and I put it down, and it came back about six months later to, to prepare it for the final. And I had named like function A, function B, function C, variable A, variable B. Var yeah, don't do not do that. I mean, it's a pain in the butt. This is one of those things where you just kind of have to train yourself to, to work through the pain, knowing that there's going to be a reward at the end. Use a lot of underscores. <laughs> use a lot of periods. Get yourself those long function names so that you know all of these functions are a member of this grouping, which is a member of this class. And yeah, then everyone at a glance knows exactly what your, your class does. Yeah, and I've, I've, you know, you're probably the million and one prep, uh, developer that I've talked to that has had this, I've had this problem. Yeah. I, mean, I write code and I'll write it with very horrible variable names, very short, maybe like using E for error, error in your code or something like that. And then you go back and you look at your code later <laughs> and you have mean? no idea what it does. <laughs> Yeah, so. exactly. So yeah, uh, use descriptive names for your for your functions and for your variables. But it's not just the name, right? So you know, obviously, classes class links you know, that single responsibility principle says that your classes should just do one thing, and that means that when you're looking at a class, it shouldn't be this massive monolithic thing on the page that you know you you should be really very simple. You know, have a several little functions, small functions to do it and be kind of small when it comes to code size. And so that also goes along with your function size. So your functions, your methods, should only do very simple things, meaning they should the shorter the better. That means that it's easier to test. Again, it's easier for people to understand when they're looking at your code. And again, it becomes very easy to maintain later on. So again, keeping your code small. And I'm not just talking like, you know, the, the what they can do or their responsibility. I'm talking the actual code that's in them. Make sure that there's not that much. Because, you know, again, it becomes very, uh, very hard to maintain it later on. Yeah. And, of course, the nemesis of every programmer, commenting. <laughs> That's right. So making sure that your code's readable is one thing. Making, you know, lots of code can not sometimes be very unreadable. Um, but also making sure that you're commenting. And so when I'm writing, when I start out writing code, I used to go and look at other people's code. And I'd walk every line of that code. And then every line I'd add a comment so I'd understand what that line did. And so I've kind of over the years taken that same approach with my code. Some people say I over comment, but when they read my code, they definitely understand its intent and what it's responsible for. And the reason why is because I put a comment every pretty much almost every other line saying this is what it's supposed to do. And this way people, when it doesn't do that, they know that there's something wrong with it. So I think that's the key is making sure you're commenting your code and every language has the ability to comment. So making sure that you do it is very important. All right. Uh, one last bit, and this is actually important because we're going to be showing this off in the module today, and that is testing your code, testing against your code. Something like Ruby on Rails actually has that built in the framework, which is, again, that's part of the black magic that is Rails. <laughs> but not all frameworks and not all coding languages have that built into, you know, the, a nice, neat ecosystem. What would you suggest for best practices on testing code? So like you said, like Ruby on Rails has the ability to generate unit tests right out of the box. You know, a lot of other frameworks uh, or other runtimes or even other languages have the ability. But, you know, really when you're coding something, you know, no matter how complex it is, what I like to do, and it actually helps, it's sometimes called test-driven development, but there's many other camps of this. And what, you, what I normally do is I'll write a test. So I'll, I'll have a list of things that I wrote out and said, this is what this class, I mean, this, this code is supposed to do. This is the intent. I write it out in a little piece of paper. 
And then I go and actually write tests that make, you know, that actually exercise that. So like, for instance, if I wanted uh, something to translate uh, a, a, a string to another language, right? So the output is that it translates it correctly. And so I'll go write a test so that it, that I expect the translation to be correct. And then what I'll do is I'll run that test. And the thing is, since I haven't read the code yet, it will fail. And then as I write the code, that test will start succeeding as I move along. And so I know that my original intent that I wrote down is being succeeded by the fact that my test is now succeeding. And so a lot of frameworks have this ability. It's usually, usually called unit tests, meaning that you're just creating a test or a specific unit in your code and it's, it's doing one thing. And then what, what test-driven development means is you write the code up front. You don't actually start with the code. You write the test first and then it will fail up front. And then as you start to code, it will start to succeed. And then you know you've done what you needed to do. Um, but again, a lot of frameworks don't have that. So like uh, Visual Studio require, uh, has it built in, but a lot of these other frameworks don't. So you, sometimes you have to go and look. Like JavaScript has JVUnit, but you got to go and find JVUnit on the web as a separate framework. So do, you know, depending on the framework, you got to go research it. You know, that might actually be a, a decent module for us to do it, a sort of a non-programming so, module where we get, get a developer like yourself and say, okay, I'm going to show you 10 different languages, I'm going to show you 10 different stress tests, things that you can get easily running against your code base just to make sure that you know, at least the basics are taken care of. That, that actually might be a, a good two, three episodes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you've actually got, uh, is it Dallas in the chat room who is saying, have you ever had someone complain that you had too much commenting? Because I've never made that complaint, ever. So I'm going to be honest, some of the veteran programmers that are around today, uh, you know, they will, they will complain. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> they will complain. Oh, but, you know, you got to remember, today's compilers and, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll you know, they simplify right. your code and they remove comments. I mean, there's no reason why you shouldn't have comments in your code other than the fact that maybe you don't have a lot of storage to store the code. But I don't believe that. So, no, no I'm not, I'm not in that school. Yeah. Well, uh, Lou, how about this? Uh, let's go ahead and take one more moment to thank the second sponsor of this episode before we go uninterrupted through episode four of four of our Ruby on Rails. Shall Let's we do, do that? Because I want to take everyone home and just, just let them bask in the glory that is that black box. And of course, the second sponsor has to be lynda.com. Now, we talk about lynda.com a lot here on the Twit TV network because we're all about learning, be it coding 101 or know-how or Twit. We, we like to let people learn at their own pace. We like to let them fill their knowledge holes with knowledge and that's what lynda.com does. Now, lynda.com is the one-stop shop on the internet to get everything you need to know, not just about programming, not just about computers, but pretty much everything. Do you want to learn new business skills? Do you want to learn about Excel? Do you want to learn about something that's going to help you in your hobby? Well, that's what lynda.com will do for you. It's for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to develop an app, learn a new programming language, master Excel, or sharpen that Photoshop skill. Well, lynda.com has everything you need to feed your curious mind. Some of the latest Lynda courses that I can recommend, because this is Coding 101, are Google App Engine Essentials, training, test-driven development with Node.js, and up and running with PHP Simple XML. I know I've talked about Code Clinic before. It's a multi-course series where lynda.com experts look at common code challenges. This is a great way to learn, and they offer their solutions using C++, C Sharp, Java, PHP, Python, and Ruby. Lou and I have talked about using the right language, the right tool for the right problem, and that's what lynda.com understands. Their experts get that they just want to give you tools for solutions. Now, with the lynda.com membership, you can watch and learn from top experts who are passionate about teaching. You can stream thousands of video courses on demand and learn on your own schedule. You get to learn at your pace, which means courses are structured so that you can watch them from start to finish or consume them in bite-sized pieces. Any way that's good for you, is good for Linda. You could take notes as you go and refer to them later, and you could even browse course transcripts so that you can follow along or find that individual section, that small bit of knowledge that you need to fix a particular problem. That's one of the things that makes lynda.com so useful. You can create and save playlists of courses that you like. You can share it with friends. In other words, you can share knowledge and you can share an easy way to learn. Really, this is what we're all about, and we thank lynda.com for being part of it. Now, with your lynda.com membership, you get unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, and I know you do because you're watching Coding 101, I want you to visit lynda.com. That's lynda.com slash C101 
and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's lynda.com slash c101. And we thank lynda.com for their support of Coding 101. Hey, Lou, you think we should get uh, a little bit of Ruby? Oh, I'm looking forward to it. How about a little bit, of, little bit of Rails? Let's do it. Let's do that. Hey, Zach, push that magic button. Thank you, Lou and Padre. I'm back here on the Sky Desk with Carlos Souza from Code School. Carlos has been guiding us through Ruby and Rails for the last three weeks, and now he's giving us a final lesson, how to use Active Record, how to hook up the model and your database, and how to profit by pushing your application live. Carlos Souza, thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've really gone, we've done a whirlwind tour through Ruby. We found out why you prefer the language, why it is so easy to learn, why it's so easy to program in. We've, we've seen all the fantastic tricks of the trade with Rails and how it sets things up and dependencies so quickly and so automatically. But there is one last step, and that is how do we push our application live? How do we make it ready for the profit? Take us through it. Yeah, so a couple of things that we're going to do before we do that. So the first thing that we're going to do is uh, make sure our server is running here. Uh, so let's go back and just run the root, right? So if you remember from our uh, second episode, the root of our application is still taking us to that welcome index. So let's change it so that it takes us to the books index because it's a reading list application, right? So let's go back and uh, open our routes file. In our routes file, I'm gonna change welcome index to books index. So okay. books index is gonna be a route. Mm -hmm. So remember, if you wanna learn more about routes file, you can literally open the file and just read the comments that Rails added for us, right? So if you go back and hit root, now we are defaulting to uh, the listing of our books. So that's step one. So before we push to production, let's create a, uh, uh, let's add an author to our game here. So basically a book has one author. An author has many books. So that's the association that we want to create. And this looks a little bit like this. So we have our book model, and we want to create, we want to create our author model. And the relationship between these two would be that an author has many books. So for each one author, it can have many books. Mm. So the way that we say that is that a book belongs to an author and an author has many books. Okay. Now remember these two, we're gonna use them in our active record models. So first thing we do is create our uh, author model. So instead of using a scaffold, I'm just going to use the generator for a model. So Rails generator model and author. And the author is gonna have one property or one database attribute, which is going to be name. So generate a model. So you can see created the migration file, our author model and our author test. Now we are going to run the migration. Right, and we, we haven't created any views, but if we jump into our Rails console, we can see that we can query the database for authors. We can create a new author. Right, we can get the first author and we can delete our author. Empty, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. And if we look at the models, 
we have our author model, which is empty, and our book model, which is empty except for that validation that we added. Now, we need to be able to link one to the other. Now, to do that, we need to add one more thing. We need to add a foreign key to books because each book will need to know to whom it belongs to. So to do that, we're going to need to make a change to the database that is not part of any model. So it's not a change that we have done yet. It's not part of the scaffold and it's not a part of creating a model. So the way that we make changes to the database in Rails is using something called a migration. So we're gonna Rails generate a migration and we're gonna say add and this is another convention for Rails. We're gonna give it the foreign key name, which is the name of the model, followed by ID. So add author ID to books, which is the name of the table. And then we're gonna say author ID is going to be an integer, and it's going to be an index. So this mm -hmm. is going to create an index on the database, mm -hmm. which basically makes it faster to do uh, searches on this specific field. So it's always a good practice to create indexes for foreign key columns. It's a database practice that Rails allows us to, uh, to follow by just adding an index like this, right? Right. So we're gonna run this migration. And if we look at the migration now, see what it looks like. So you can see that it has an add column method that says uh, add a column to books named author ID and the type is integer. And then on the following line, it says add an index to the book stable in the author ID column. So this is the Ruby code that Rails will translate into SQL. So let's run this migration I just created. Okay, so he added the author ID column. Now, if we want to look at the current state of our database, we're going to look at this one file called schema.rb. So this is what our database looks like. It has the author stable with the name, and then created at and updated at are sort of a, a magic database fields that Rails automatically manages for us. So we know when each record was created and when it was last updated. We don't have to worry about it from a development perspective. Rails takes care of it and it creates it automatically for us. And now the books table has a title and a description in the two uh, uh, date time fields. And at the bottom, it has the author ID which is the foreign key that it'll use to associate a book with its author. And then down at the bottom last thing, we create an index for that column. So this is our Ruby, and again, Rails translates this to SQL. Now this is all the database changes that we needed to do. Now let's jump into our model. So first thing we're gonna do is jump into our book model and say that it belongs to an author. That's it. Now in our author model, we're going to say that has many books. Yep. Books. Boom. That's all we needed to do. And these two methods connect these two models, and it gives us a bunch of, uh, of methods that we can call on, the, on, on their objects. Now let's look at what those methods are. Fire up a console. Let's create an author, just to make sure that we don't have any. So dot count just generates a SQL count. Uh, let's create a new author. So now it's going to be, uh, which books do we have? Uh, we've got Harry Potter in there. <laughs> yeah, and the Gunslinger. Okay, right. perfect. So the first author is going to be J.K. Rowling. And the second author is going to be Stephen King. And now what we'll do is uh, let me store these in variables. So uh, call this rolling author first. 
and then king author last. So now uh, rolling is a variable holding the JK Rowling record and King is holding Stephen King. So now let's get our first book. Call it uh, book one, which is The Gunslinger. So the author of this book is Stephen King. So I'm going to do book one, author. Let's just call this method now and see what it does. It's nil. So it says it does not have an author. Now, if we do author ID, it's nil. So notice, let me open it up here, app model book. Notice that all we have here is belongs to author. We don't have a setter or a getter for uh, uh, explicit getters or setters for this, uh, for, this uh, uh, method, for this property. So if we go back and do author equals king in book one dot save, now we can see that book one author is linked to Stephen King. Right, so if you do book first, the gunslinger, if we do author, it knows how to generate the proper SQL statement that pulls the author for that given book. Of course, it goes the other way around because that author has that book. Exactly. So if we did author uh, last, let's get, well, yeah, we have king, right? Mm -hmm. So there you go, king. If we do king.books, it's going to bring in all the books that belong uh, that yeah, that belong to uh, to Stephen King. Now this this doesn't right. look all that impressive because there's only two records in there right now. But as we were to add more and more books, you'd right. see more and more why you want that relationship. Yes, exactly, exactly. So now let's show this from a web view. Let's change our view to display the author name by the book, right? So let's go here and right. So right now all we have is a. Uh, is the title of the book. Let's go here, app views books index, and uh, next to the title, let's say that we want to say by, and then the name of the author. So book author. Let me break the line here just to make this easier to read. Right. Right. So let's see what that looks like. Hmm. Hmm. Well, it brought the author, but it's printing out the object reference. Right, right. Right. Ideally, we want to say Stephen King, which is the name of the author, right? So let's go ahead and do models author and say and override the 2S method on the model to return the name. Because essentially, <laughs> this is the method that's being called on our view. Right, right. It's getting our, our, uh, our uh, rec active record object and calling 2s. So if you override this and tell it to return name instead, now we have our author name. Right? Nice. Let me go ahead and uh, also add to uh, book last, which is uh, Harry Potter, HP. So HP author right now is nil. I'm going to add it rolling HP save. So this is the console. I'm going to go back and re-render our web view. And you can see that JK Rowling is now set as the author for Harry Potter. And of course, if we wanted to improve the interface a little bit, we could make the author hot links so that you can see what books that author has. Yes, yes. Want to do that? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. Uh, so the first thing we want to do, books uh, index, is add a link here. So we're going to link to, if you remember the helper from our previous example, to book author. All right. Let me break this into two lines here. Okay, so you'll notice here we are using the author as both the string for the link and also the argument for where the link's going to be generated to, right? So let's go ahead and just do that so we can see what the link is. Oops. So it's saying 
that there's an undefined method author path. And what this means is that link two looks at the routes, look at a, it looks at a routes file to know which routes we have uh, to work with. Right now, our routes file knows nothing about authors. Because when we created authors, we created the model. We didn't create the scaffold. Oh, right, so, right, right. Okay. Right? Yeah. So let's go ahead and add authors to our routes file and refresh our page. Now we can see that the link is there. Right? Mm -hmm. If we click here, we don't have the page yet, but it's taking us to the proper URL. So we clicked on the first author, it took us to slash authors slash three. And when we click on the second one, it takes us to slash authors slash two. So let's go ahead and uh, create those. Uh, first thing we have to create is a controller, right? Because that's what's saying, the error message saying, uninitialized constant authors controller. So again, if you just follow the error messages, you're gonna be able to figure out what, what you need to do. So then app controller authors controller create authors controller inherit from application controller and create our show action which is what uh, which is the action that we need to implement because we're showing a specific author we're not listing the authors so in here we're going to assign uh, an author. And we get this param on the routes, the params ID, and we use that to find the author. If you remember from the console, we did, not with author, I think we did with books, we can do find two, and that will return the object. And this is the same method that we're using here in the controller. So we're finding an author and assigning to authors, author. And another good practice is to never assign to variables in the view. So this is gonna make sense in a second, but what I'm gonna do here is say books equals author dot books. So now we have these two variables, instance variables that we can access in our author's view. So let's go ahead and we might need to create the authors folder. Yep. So let's yep. make there authors and inside of there create HTML ERB and call this uh, author. Well, let's just give it the name of the author, right? Author. And let's go ahead and just render that and see if it works. It works. It has the name of the author, right? JK Rowling and Stephen King. Now let's list their books. So UL, an unordered list, and now I'm going to loop. If you remember how we looped from our first example, uh, from our first episode, we're going to mm -hmm. do the each, each do book. As an internal iterator that it gets from the log. Exactly, exactly. And then do uh, book. Title, L, I. All right, so now if we render, we can see the list of books of this specific author and list of books of this specific <laughs> author. So let's add another book. Let's do, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, I know any other book by her. <laughs> uh, she does the thing of fanciful creatures, the, the non-Harry Potter book she did. Just do another Harry Potter book. All right. Well, <laughs> casual vacancy. That's yeah. not that's not a hard name. All right. So book, create, title, the casual vacancy description. Never read it. Uh, <laughs> oh, I forgot to add the author, right? So let's go ahead. Uh, so the last command that we run on the terminal is always assigned to this magic variable underline. So I'm just going to say you know, casual. You see what I did here? So mm -hmm. the underline assigns mm -hmm. to casual. So I'm going to say casual author equals uh, rolling, I think. Yep. So casual save. Now when we refresh, 
you can see that it's there. Nice. Right. So simple. Isn't it? Oh, I know. I, you know, Carlos, I, I have to ask here because some people in the chat room, M5 was fretting that we were going to make that the homework. Uh, can we make the homework harder for them? <laughs> we have to. It's the last one. They, we have, they have to have something that's really going to challenge them. We're still going to go over production, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break from tradition here and, and ask what's the homework uh, um, now. That is a great idea. So let's make the homework. So if you, were, if you notice, we're adding authors on the Rails console. Mm -hmm. Right. So the oh, homework yes. will be to figure out how to add authors through the web interface. There we go. Because the web so, interface was all, was automatically created. Now we need to see if you can alter it so that you exactly. can do the same thing from the web interface that we just did from the console. Exactly. And the one hint I'm going to give you is that you're going to need a drop down box, a select box. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know how to do that, just look up any HTML primer. You're going to find it. It's very simple. And let me think. Yes, yes. Actually, Carlos already gave you everything you're going to need because he, sh he showed you how to pull params uh, in order to make this work. Yep. All right. Okay, Carlos, now that we've got the homework, let's go to the money shot because the money shot has to be how do I take this web ap application that I just created <laughs> and make it rain all over my web server? <laughs> let's do it. So uh, all right, I've been... Uh, using Git so far to just uh, uh, commit different versions of, uh, of this app so that if we ever run into issues, we can go back to, to previous versions and uh, sort of uh, debug our app. So I'm going to go ahead and just commit the latest changes. Uh, so add author and relationships. Okay, so our Git is clean. So what we are going to do is uh, deploy our Rails applications to Heroku. If you don't know Heroku, you should definitely check it out, heroku.com. Uh, it's a great uh, platform as a service. And what this means is that they have everything ready uh, for you to deploy your Rails applications without having to worry about the infrastructure, right? I'm not being paid to say this. I've used them forever. I use them all the time best way to get started and, th and actually uh, this is the future i mean this is this is what we talk about now we're, we're all you package your application and you push it onto infrastructure someplace else so yep. this, this is not a secret this is not a, an yep. advertising this is your choice for doing just that yep absolutely and they they not only support uh rails they support uh pretty much any other language out there uh node.js python go uh php whatever so this is what we're going to use uh i i mean i've been using for years so I have already set up all my environment. I have an account there. I have everything. Uh, so uh, which this mean, which means that I have this Heroku command in, uh, on my uh, terminal, right? Which is what we're going to use to create our slug or our dyno or our you know, instance of a server on Heroku. All right, cool. So let's create an app, Heroku Apps Create. And we're not going to give it an If you want it to use a specific name, we could use it as an argument. If not, Heroku just gives us a random name. And I always like to see how creative Heroku can get. So Heroku Apps Create, Damp Spire 3408. <laughs> so that's the name of our app. All right. And what if you look at the last message, you'll see that Git Remote Heroku added. So if you look at the remote that we have here, you see that we have a Heroku remote. And what this means is that we're going to use Git to deploy our Rails applications. So Rails application deployment, our Rails application deployment will be nothing more than a Git push to this Heroku remote. That's it. Now, there are a couple of things that we have to do to our Rails app to make it Heroku ready. Let's go over them real quick. The first one is to change the database that we use in production. So, so far, we have been using SQLite 3 for all of our different environments, for development, for running your tests, and it's currently set up as production. But Heroku does not support SQLite. Instead, it uses a much, much, much more powerful database, uh, which is called Postgres, PostgreSQL. So what we do here is we, we give this 
SQLite Gym, a group of development, well, actually development and test. So this, this is another cool thing about Rails. So it allows you to use different databases on different environments. So for this one, we're going to use development and test SQLite 3. And then, let me see if I have anything else here. Uh, well, it's already here, right? Anyway, so the gem PG, which is going to be for group production. So essentially what I'm saying is that when I run my application in development or test, I wanted to use SQLite 3. But when I use it in production, I want to use Postgres. Now, we don't have to worry about database credentials because the file that we use uh, for database credentials gets overridden, gets replaced by Heroku when we deploy our app. So that Heroku injects and uses whatever credentials they need for their database service, right? So this is the file, and you can see there, there's a development uh, a group here, and then there's also a test and a production, right? But we're not using production. So that is the first step. The next step is to add another gem called the Rails 12 Factor. Now, 12 Factor is a series of practices for deploying apps to the cloud. So if you Google uh, 12 Factor app, the 12 Factor app, 12factor.net, there's a very cool article that goes over each of, uh, of the factors, which are 12, to not much surprise, and uh, why they're important. So, uh, so these factors or these practices were all bundled into this gem called Rails 12 Factor so that we can use uh, uh, in production. So uh, also in production, the gem Rails 12 Factor group production. And that's what we need. Let's now bundle our app because we changed our gem file. And every time we change our gem file, we need to bundle it again and generate another gem file.lock. And let's add uh, that. So git add, and see what's staged. And then we can say ready for Heroku. Now our git stage is clean. Just to point out, we have the Heroku remote uh, that was added with uh, by the Heroku apps create command. And now all we need to do is Heroku uh, git push Heroku, which is the remote and master, which is the current branch that we're on. So let's see what that looks like. So you can see that this is a git hook that they have over there. They already detected a Ruby app. So they're creating our server on the fly. They're compiling Ruby and Rails, installing all of the dependencies. <laughs> That's actually pretty slick. I like that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And then it's going to get to the database part, right? Towards the end here? Yes. Well, half true. It's the next step. Generating all the assets, which are all the you know the JavaScript, the CSS, and all that stuff. Right. So it's about to launch our app. Launched our app. All right. So it's launched, but we still need to run the migrations. Right. So the connection is there. It's connecting to the database, but it doesn't run the migrations automatically. So the same commands that we ran locally, the rake commands, we can run them on Heroku by simply using Heroku run rake db migrates. So when we run this, we're going to run rake db migrate on our Heroku instance. Right. So it's going to take everything out of our, um, our light database and push it into theirs. No. 
No, no, no. It's not going to copy anything out of our database. It's going to it's going to run the migrations on our app. Oh, okay, okay, got it. Okay, sorry. Right. <clears throat> yep. So you can see here, you can see the commands that it ran and then the uh... output. Right. And now, if we want to open our app, we do Heroku open. That actually is. I have never seen that app. before. That's nice and slick. Yep. So our app is there, but there's no data in there, right? Right. So let's just create one thing. Now, remember, we ran the Rails console when we were locally, right? Mm -hmm. So let's do the same thing now, but on Heroku. So Heroku run Rails console. Takes a little bit more time. It's running remote. It's yeah, there, right? exactly. Right. So now author create name JK Rowling. JK now books create title Harry Potter description AU wizard. Now if you refresh. Can see it's there, right? In production. So, open to the world. Yep, open so, to the world. And now all you got to do is sit back and just wait for the money to roll in. Absolutely, that's exactly <laughs> how it happens. <laughs> it's I actually that's what I've heard. I've heard that once you publish your first app, someone just shows up with a big bag of cash. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I hear someone knocking on the door already. So <laughs> might be, might be that. Carlos, this this has been amazing. Four episodes, and you brought us from not knowing anything about Ruby to being astonished by at Rails to being able to actually push up an app on uh, an, an app deployment service. This this is fantastic. Thank you so very much for being here. Uh, you could have done so much more with your free time. So thank you for spending it with the Twit TV Army. Could you please? Tell the people where they can find you. I mean, of course, it's Code School. Of course, it's the place that you go on the internet if you want to learn how to build a, a web app, if you want to learn how to do development. It's the place where you go if you want to learn just to, how this programming thing works, if you want just a little inkling as to the world that you live in. But you are located in many places. Could you please tell them where they can find Carlos Souza? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you want to look at some, uh, some of the code that I participate in, either one of my projects or one of the open source contributions that I have, uh, go to my GitHub page, uh, github.com slash Kaike. And uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's the same handle, twitter.com slash Kaike. And uh, I also help co-host a couple of different podcasts. There's the Ruby 5 podcast, which is a fast-paced, latest news, five-minute podcast on the latest and uh, greatest on the on the Ruby and Rails community. Uh, check it out, ruby5.codeschool.com. You can also subscribe to it. Uh, if you're more of a JavaScript developer, there's another podcast that I also participate, which is called Five Minutes of JavaScript, 5js.codeschool.com. Same type of style, five minutes. We don't want to waste your time. Uh, we want to give you the latest news in the JavaScript uh, community. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, lastly, Code School. If you want to learn more about Ruby on Rails, uh, JavaScript, Git, GitHub, HTML, CSS, SAS, or any of the major JavaScript frameworks as well, Ember, Angular, uh, Backbone, uh, check it out, codeschool.com. And I want to thank you, Padre, and uh, everybody on Twit. Uh, it's been a pleasure participating on this. Uh, this is a lot of fun. I enjoy this, and uh, if you ever want me back, just drop us drop us a line, and I'll be more than happy more than happy to come back here. Oh, absolutely! You know we're going to ask for you back, but but you know what? Let, let's do one more thing. You got to throw another plug in for Rails for Zombies because oh, okay. seriously, that is a lot of fun. <laughs> nice, yeah, absolutely. So if you uh, if you want to uh, learn more about Rails, but you're not sure if it's your thing or not and you don't want to spend countless hours trying to install it locally before you can install it, before you can start using it, go to railsforzombies.org. This is what it looks like. Uh, it's an interactive browser-based tutorial. So again, you don't have to install anything in your computer. You're going to watch a couple of videos, very short videos, very fun, 
Uh, we try to make them as engaging and fun as possible. And then after each video, you are given a, uh, a couple of challenges about the specific subject that we just taught. So uh, this is one example uh, using uh, the Rails console. Again, this is all in the browser. So he's saying trying to find a zombie with ID one. So this is easy, zombie.find1, congratulations, you got it right. So you, uh, that's what the course looks like. Uh, it's about six levels and we teach you uh, all the most important uh, uh, aspects and uh, components of Rails. Kind of like what we've done here in these four episodes, but in the browser, uh, you can do it again. And uh, after you're done, you can decide whether or not Rails is a good fit uh, for, uh, for you, so. Again, Carlos Souza, thank you so very much for being our Code Warrior, sir. We are forever indebted to you, and we salute you. Thank you very much. See ya. And back to you, Padre and Lou, back on the Code Desk. Lou, I got to say, I had so much fun with Carlos Souza. I, I, I can't give this man enough props. He came on. He gave us a, a topic that a lot of people weren't sure that they wanted to learn. And I got to say, from the comments that we've had in the group, from, from the tweets, from the emails I've gotten, uh, I, think, I think we've made some converts to, uh, to Ruby and Ruby on Rails. Yeah, he did a fantastic job. He has some great examples, too. Yeah. And, and you know what? Uh, that whole idea of, of having a, a, a framework, an IDE that just kind of bugs you to test your code, I like that. That's, that's the kind of thing that you, you want to have happen in any sort of framework so that the code that you're developing isn't going to be stilted by something you did, you know, um, half a year ago. It's absolutely, when you can specify your intent up front and be able to verify it as you move along, that's always made, being a better coder and being a better programmer in the end. Yeah. Uh, now, Lou, we are actually off next week because of Memorial Day here in the United States. But when we come back, we've got three straight weeks of wild card episodes. The reason why we have three is because we kind of we, we cheated out a little bit on the last module. We started the last <laughs> module early because we kind of wanted to get into it. So we're going to give you three this time, and we're going to start with Peggy Fisher, who is a master of STEM, so that's STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, we want to bring her unique perspective to coding, to programming, specifically to, to reaching the coding world to those who might otherwise be excluded. But of course, I, I want to thank you, Lou Maresco, as our super special permanent co-host, we, we really, I'm, you know what, I'm just going to keep extending it. Your title's going to get longer and longer each week. Uh, you, you really bring so much to the show, and I'm so happy to have you as my co-host. Could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you and your work? Absolutely. All, you can always find me on Twitter at LouMM, L-O-U-M-M. And of course, all my work that I do during my day job is found at CRM, that dynamics.com. Yeah, and uh, don't forget that you can find Lou here on the Twitch TV network. He does guest appearances on This Week in Enterprise Tech. I'm actually trying to get him on a know-how, and before you buy, he's that, that that's coming up very soon. So uh, you're going to see more of Mr. Maresca. Uh, don't forget that you can always get all of our back episodes. We know that these modules kind of lend themselves to to being downloaded, so you can watch them and rewatch them at your leisure. Just go to our show page at twit.tv slash code or coding 101. It all goes to the same place. There you'll be able to download full episodes in any format that you want. You want it in an audio format, a video format, a high-definition video format, in case you, you want to follow us at home. Well, not only that, you could subscribe so that every episode automatically gets dropped into your device of choice in the format of choice. If you want it in your iPhone, your iPod, your iPad, your Android tablet, your, your Mac, your PC, laptop, or desktop, we've got a selection for you because, well, we, we love you. Also, don't forget that we have show notes available. There's been something really glitchy. I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but we'll get it all sorted out. I know I promise this a lot, but I, I, we're not having a whole lot of luck with this. At some point, I, I may have to have Lou Maresca take a look and see what we're doing wrong. But uh, just, again, go to twit.tv slash code if you want to get the assets so you can follow along in each module. Also, don't forget that we do the show live, or mostly live, every Monday at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. Just go to live.twit.tv. And as long as you're watching live, why not jump into the chat room? I've got you right down there. There's a little screen that has a chat room scrolling so that if you have a question, if you have an answer, if you have a comment that you think should go on the air, it's a really good way to involve yourself in the experiment that is Twit TV. Finally, don't forget that you can find me at Twitter at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. If you follow me, you'll find out who our guests will be for each week. You'll find out topics and you'll be able to suggest future guests for Coding 101. In fact, the last three guests all came from your suggestions. So if you want to contribute, if you want to be part of Coding 101, follow me at Twitter.
twitter.com slash PadreSJ. Oh, wait, wait, one last note. I want to thank my super TD, because along with Lisa and Leo, who let me do this show, he is the man most responsible for making this happen. That's right, it's Eskimo Zach. Zach, could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you? Or not. Thank you, Padre. <laughs> I got to get my mic on. Um, yes, you can find me on Twitter at Eskimo Zach. That's Eskimo Zach with an H. E-S-K-I-M-O-Z-A-C-H. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balliser. That guy back there is Lou Maresca. This has been Coding 101. End of line.